Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality characteristics of the fictional character Charles McGill, also referred to as Chuck McGill, from the television series Better Call Saul. Other questions I'll answer here, is electromagnetic sensitivity a real disorder? And what diagnosis would Chuck McGill actually have if he were a real person? So a few important things here. This video contains spoilers for the series Better Call Saul. And Chuck McGill, of course, is a fictional character. And I'll be diagnosing this character, not the actor that plays him. We see that the character Chuck McGill is played by the actor Michael McKean. Chuck McGill is Jimmy McGill's older brother. And he plays a major part in the first three seasons. So that's what I'm really looking at here is the first three seasons of the series. He has an unusual personality and a contentious relationship with Jimmy McGill, but the main focus of this character is this electromagnetic sensitivity referred to in the series. I'm going to refer to this as EHS. Chuck McGill's character is really one of the most fascinating characters on television in large part because of the way the EHS is handled here. So I'm going to run through a brief timeline and then get to the mental health and personality characteristics of Chuck McGill. So the timeline from series one through three, we see that Chuck McGill is an attorney, a partner in a law firm called HHM located in New Mexico. Jimmy McGill is his younger brother, played by Bob Odenkirk. Chuck helps Jimmy escape the consequences of Jimmy's criminal behavior in Illinois, but makes this deal with him where Jimmy now has to move out to New Mexico. Jimmy takes a job working in the mailroom of HHM, but he secretly goes to college and law school and becomes a lawyer hoping to work for the firm. Chuck McGill prevents this from happening, but keeps this information from Jimmy. So Jimmy doesn't realize that Chuck McGill blocked him from working at the law firm. At some point, Chuck McGill develops EHS and he experiences physical pain, anxiety, disorientation, and other symptoms when he's exposed to electromagnetic fields. I'll refer to these as EMFs. Jimmy takes care of Chuck for quite some time, shopping for him, bringing him supplies so that Chuck doesn't have to have anything electric in the house. So he's really working around all the demands that Chuck puts in place because of the EHS. Now, as I mentioned, the relationship is contentious. We see that Jimmy wants to be accepted by Chuck. He looks up to him. But Chuck cannot reconcile Jimmy's status as an attorney with Jimmy's behavior as a criminal. Eventually, Chuck is able to provoke Jimmy into a criminal act against him by letting Jimmy know that Chuck recorded him confessing to a prior crime. Jimmy takes this deal where he's not convicted of the charges, but he still has to face the state bar because his behavior was not appropriate for an attorney. In a hearing before the state bar, we see that Jimmy exposes Chuck's disorder, EHS, as being mental in nature as opposed to being physical in nature. Jimmy is suspended for one year, but not disbarred. But because of Chuck's testimony, and because Jimmy told Chuck's insurance company about Chuck's condition, we see that things start to unravel for Chuck McGill. His partner in the law firm, Howard, buys out Chuck and forces him to retire. In this one last discussion we see between Chuck and Jimmy, Chuck rejects Jimmy entirely. Chuck McGill's symptoms become exacerbated to the point where he's tearing apart the walls of his house to find sources of electrical current, and shortly thereafter, he takes his own life. So now taking a look at the mental health here for Chuck McGill. So outside of the electromagnetic sensitivity, so put that aside for the moment, we see that Chuck appears to have obsessive compulsive personality disorder, so OCPD. This is different than obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. Now, it's not unusual for people with OCPD to be highly successful in work environments, especially work environments that require a high level of attention to details. We see in the case of Chuck, he does work as an attorney. He has experience with corporate and insurance regulations. So in this business, attention to detail is critical. OCPD contains eight symptom criteria. Four are required for a diagnosis. Chuck doesn't meet all of the criteria for this disorder, but he does meet six of the eight, which of course is enough for a diagnosis. Looking at the symptoms, we see that he is preoccupied with order, rules, and organization. He's perfectionistic. He's excessively devoted to work 
and productivity, he's overconscientious, scrupulous, and inflexible about areas of morality, ethics, or values. He's reluctant to delegate tasks to others, and he's stubborn and rigid. Now, I mentioned he doesn't meet two of the symptom criteria. He doesn't appear to hold on to worthless objects, and he doesn't seem to have a miserly spending style. But again, overall, he meets the symptom criteria, so he could have this diagnosis. So the OCPD is somewhat clear, but what about the EHS? Is this a real condition? Does Chuck actually have this, or does he have a mental disorder that explains his symptoms? So the idea that somebody can be affected adversely by electromagnetic fields goes back many years. Many individuals have reported symptoms that they believe are caused by being in close proximity to EMFs. There are a wide variety of symptoms that have been reported. Just a few examples here, dizziness, headaches, difficulty concentrating, memory loss, skin irritation, gastrointestinal difficulties, respiratory problems, and fatigue. And we see, of course, that Chuck McGill endorses a lot of these symptoms. Now, EHS is also referred to as idiopathic environmental intolerance attributed to electromagnetic fields. So I-E-I-E-M-F. But again, I'm just going to call it EHS. There are many theories as to what's going on with EHS. I'll start with the theories that point toward it not existing and look at some of the arguments that it may exist, then provide my opinion about Chuck McGill's presentation. Electromagnetic fields are force fields that have an electrical and magnetic component oriented perpendicularly to each other. Major sources of EMFs include both high and low voltage power lines, electrical wiring and structures like in a house or a commercial building, microwave ovens, radio and television transmitters, devices with electric motors, mobile phones, and computer monitors. The intensity of electrical fields is typically measured in volts per meter. Magnetic field intensity is measured with the micro Tesla. There have been many studies on the effects of EMF on humans. No adverse effects from EMF exposure have ever been demonstrated at the levels to which people are routinely exposed. Some examples of both electrical and magnetic field intensity levels really illustrate this point well. So on the electrical side, let's take a look at some of the intensity levels for common exposure scenarios. So if someone's sitting in a house, they're being exposed to 20 volts per meter. If they're standing a few meters from an FM transmitter, that's 50 volts per meter. One centimeter away from a mobile phone antenna, 90 volts per meter. Standing in a meadow during quiet weather conditions, 100 to 200 volts per meter. Standing on a carpet, 200 volts per meter. Standing on a carpet after rubbing the carpet, 4,500 volts per meter, or 4.5 kilovolts per meter. So it seems pretty clear from that that even ordinary exposures are at a high level compared to devices that humans make, right? But what about the magnetic side? Maybe the magnetic side paints a different picture. Well, if somebody's standing one meter away from a household appliance, they're exposed to 0 0.002 micro Tesla. A mobile phone antenna, 0.3 micro Tesla. Standing in a subway train, 20 micro Tesla. The Earth's magnetic field, to which all humans are exposed all the time, 30 micro Tesla. So we're really in the same position. Things that people are exposed to all the time create more EMF than man-made objects, again, in terms of routine exposure. Now we see that the weakest magnetic fields that have been shown to induce biological and cognitive effects are at least 25 to 50 times stronger than what people encounter in everyday life. Studies have shown that when participants who have EHS are exposed to real EMF, but told that they're not being exposed, they don't have symptoms. When they're exposed to fake EMF, but told that it is real, they do have symptoms. No studies have actually connected EMF exposure to the symptoms described by people who have EHS. Often the symptoms associated with EHS existed sometime before the individual attributed them to electromagnetic fields, which has led some researchers to believe that people may be having medically unexplained symptoms and then attribute that to EMF. So in essence, they're attempting to identify and therefore have some control over the cause of their symptoms. Another possibility is the nocebo effect. 
So to understand this, we have to understand the placebo effect. So the placebo effect is when somebody's exposed to an inert substance or condition. So something that could not possibly cause their condition to improve, but they improve. They have a positive effect from it, right? So they feel better. The nocebo effect is when somebody's exposed to an inert substance or condition and they experience negative effects. So that could be happening here with EHS. People who report EHS tend to have symptoms of anxiety, depression, and intolerance of other environmental factors. For example, contaminants in the air or water or noise pollution. So it's not usually just the EMF that they're experiencing difficulties with. Another factor here might be the media. The media seems to be driving the idea that EMFs cause problems. We see this random sample of 60 articles on EMF was taken from British newspapers. 72% encouraged readers to believe that EMF caused adverse effects. 40% suggested possible remedies, so remedies to a problem that has not been proven to exist. One of the most popular theories in relation to EHS is that the condition is psychosomatic. So people experience real pain or other symptoms like dizziness or fatigue, but there's no physical health explanation for the symptoms. So essentially, it's a mental disorder. Another possibility for a small percentage of the cases would be a somatic delusion. Sometimes these delusions appear with disorders like schizophrenia, delusional disorder, or major depressive disorder with psychotic features. So with all this in mind, could EHS be real? That is, could some cases be completely unrelated to mental health factors? Well, the reality is we just don't know for certain. There are some arguments in favor of EHS existing or at least in favor of continued research on this construct. So it could be that individuals with EHS are only sensitive to certain frequencies, and the studies we have seen so far haven't really looked at that too closely. It could be that exposure to EMF doesn't have an effect immediately, that there's a delayed response, which also hasn't been factored into a number of studies. We see that studies can't really simulate the true environment. They take place in a controlled setting. So there could be toxins or other factors that people are being exposed to in their natural environment that they're not being exposed to during the experiments. Now, these are interesting theories. Even though EHS doesn't appear to be related to EMFs, we can't rule out the possibility that this does happen to an exceedingly small percent of the population. Most of the time, however, when somebody experiences EHS, there is another explanation that has nothing to do with electromagnetic fields. So this brings us back to the fictional character Chuck McGill. So in the series Better Call Saul, we see the narrative leads us to believe that Chuck McGill has a mental disorder and not a physical disorder. For example, he had the battery in his breast pocket during that hearing in front of the state bar, and he never noticed any effects from it. There are a number of potential diagnoses to consider here. I'm going to cover the ones that stand out the most. So the first one I hear a lot about is schizophrenia. There are many reasons why I don't think that Chuck McGill has schizophrenia. It may be that Chuck has delusions, but we really don't see much evidence of hallucinations. We see his speech is not disorganized, and he doesn't have negative symptoms. Now, the term negative symptoms, this gets confusing some of the time. This doesn't mean that somebody's having negative mood. A negative symptom is when somebody's not showing any affect, so they're not expressing a positive or a negative emotion. They kind of have a flat look on their face, just kind of staring off a little bit. Not necessarily catatonic, I'll talk about that in a moment, but just kind of staring off, and again, not really reacting to stimuli and not being expressive. Now, Chuck has a lot of negative emotions. That's different than negative symptoms. With his negative emotions, as well as his positive emotions, he is expressive. We can tell what he's feeling from looking at his face. So if we can do that, he does not have negative symptoms. Now, in one of the episodes, we see there is a reference to catatonia. When he's in the hospital, after falling over, he goes through all these tests that involve electrical equipment, like the CT scan, and he ends up catatonic. This has led some people to believe that he must have schizophrenia. Well, catatonia is actually nonspecific, so it can occur with schizophrenia, yes, and that's how we think of it most of the time. But it can also occur with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and a number of other mental disorders. Additionally, it's unlikely to develop schizophrenia at Chuck's age. 
the onset of the disorder almost always occurs before the age of 30. So that addresses the potential of schizophrenia. What about delusional disorder? Well, this is a possibility. This is a rare diagnosis. For the diagnosis to be appropriate, we would have to establish that Chuck's belief that he is sensitive to electromagnetic fields is in fact delusional. The reason that I'm reluctant to go this far has to do with what happened toward the end of Chuck McGill's time on the show. That incident with the battery I talked about before, where he had the battery in his pocket and he didn't feel it, this made him question whether or not his condition had a mental component to it. In addition, he also started using a grounding technique, like he was looking around and describing objects, like when he was walking through the grocery store, suggesting that he understood there was a cognitive component to his symptoms. If somebody has a delusion, they usually don't really seriously question that belief. Now, of course, it could be argued that this was a temporary insight, because just after this, we see he tears apart his house looking for sources of electricity. So it could be that he did have a delusion, but just had a temporary moment of doubt. Even still, this is an unsatisfying diagnosis, given his presentation. Another possibility is somatic symptom disorder. This comes up a lot when talking about EHS. I think this is probably the best diagnosis given the information we have available about this character. Based on what we see in the series, it does appear that his pain and other symptoms are real. He truly feels them. The episode of catatonia, of course, doesn't fit with this diagnosis, but again, this could have been caused by the great amount of stress that he was under. Somatic symptom disorder is more consistent with the idea of him challenging disbelief and gaining some level of insight which again, we saw a little bit here in the series. As we look at Chuck's presentation, we see a lot of symptoms and characteristics pointing in different directions diagnostically. So it gets confusing. It's hard to figure out what's really going on. And I think this is really the genius of how this character was portrayed in the series, if this was done on purpose. I don't know if it was on purpose or not. And looking at the research literature repeatedly, we see stories of clinicians being confused by the symptom presentations that involve EHS. Clinicians don't know how to explain the symptoms. The symptoms don't seem to fit with any category that's been established. And again, when looking at the Chuck McGill character, we see the same thing. It's hard to put him in an established category. The story really doesn't give us a clear indication that he has schizophrenia, delusional disorder, or somatic symptom disorder. We really only get clarity about the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So again, if this was done on purpose, it was really quite remarkable to create this presentation that's confusing in a way that's similar to what we see in real life. So those are my thoughts on Chuck McGill. I know whenever I look at the mental health and personality characteristics of fictional characters, there will always be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this analysis of Chuck McGill to be interesting. Thanks for watching.